Hello everyone, welcome to Naomi's Bookshelf. Today we're going to talk about my thoughts on Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. So Vanity Fair is a reread for me. I reread it this February and I really loved rereading it. It's something that I'm surprised I really enjoy actually because this is a kind of book I would hate typically. But this book I would like to talk about first in spoiler free terms in case anyone would like to know what it is. But then I'm going to get into spoilers because I do like to have discussion videos about these kinds of books. I have a whole series called Timeless Tomes where I discuss big thick classics and this one sure counts because it's over 700 pages. Um, actually, the first book I ever did for Timeless Tome episode was this book. And I have since reread it and I would like to, I don't know, have a rethoughts or do something with my thoughts and discuss what I have read and how my thoughts have changed maybe. I didn't rewatch my video so I have no idea if I'll be saying the same stuff again. But I would like to think that my reading has grown since I've read this book since the first time. So at the beginning of this book, we have Becky Sharp and Amelia Sedley, who are both coming from a school. Becky Sharp is actually a teacher there, and Amelia Sedley is actually a student. And they are both leaving there as a Becky is going to become a governess at a home, and Amelia is now done schooling. Now, they are both going to stay at Amelia's home as they are friends, but Becky is definitely not from the same class as them. Becky's parents are not well-bred people. Her father was a painter, her mother was an opera dancer or opera singer, and she is very looked down on society. Amelia Sedley's family is very high up. They're not nobility, but they are well-classed. This is a Victorian novel. And this is actually historical fiction as it's set during the Napoleonic War. And so this book is a satire. It does not have heroes. It has many villains, if you want to call them that. And the real main character of this book is Becky Sharp. I would more actually call this book a, an ensemble cast of characters. But if you want to have the main person, we have an anti-hero in Becky Sharp. Through this book, we follow Becky and Amelia as well. So maybe two heroes or two anti-heroes as they go through life and as many challenges as it is for women during that time we see them go through life choices through positions that they have really no control over and positions that they do have control over you see them go through many stages and whether that brings them together or apart it is always interesting to see and i really actually enjoy this book because of how they take life's opportunities and what they do with those different kinds of situations. I think it's very interesting to see how these two women who are very different can how they react to those same deals of life that they have to unfortunately go through. One thing that I think is an interesting note about this book is that the author, William Thackeray, is kind of, I don't know, playing a game with this book. He says that Vanity Fair is like a play that you're watching. And so the author sits with us on the back and he is watching the players with us and they say, look at those players, look at Becky Sharp as she's doing this. And we can read over Becky's shoulder as she's sending a note off to this person. Or we can see this as we are sitting here together. So it really is a weird, in a way, style of writing. But at the same time, I really enjoyed how it was definitely like a stage play and we are the audience watching the play but the author's with us as we watch. It feels like Vanity Fair is a place but it's really about the society drama that goes around and how everyone contributes to it and how it is a society norm to go in and out of this Vanity Fair and how you dress up and how you participate and how you react to other people who you step on or lift up according to what you do. And it's very fascinating to me how this kind of examines the culture of those people, but also kind of looks down on them, much like a satire does, while making fun of them, but not really telling them that they're being made fun of. It's really, I think, an interesting balance, and I really enjoy that as it is told. But it is a thick book, so if you want to be prepared, it is big but I think it's worth it because it does have an interesting storyline and that goes through many, many events and has many characters. Like I said, I feel like it's an ensemble cast of book. It's not like Anna Karenina, which has one person's name on the title and has an ensemble group of characters. This one is Vanity Fair and it has a cast of characters and who are in Vanity Fair. A little thing before we get into spoilers terms. I will get into spoilers very soon though. Um, I think the themes about this, in case you're wanting to know before you go in, the themes are definitely about class, status, money, and how you survive with it. But also I think it talks about 
a good deal about relationships. I think that's really what the core of it is. From what my second read of it was, I feel like the core relationships that you go through in life and how you treat those people in your life and what drives those relationships forward. I feel like that was a big deal in this book. And I, I really saw that in, of value in here. I think it's something that you can pick up from and how you can relate to the people who are in here. So now we're getting into spoiler terms, but I highly recommend picking this up. And if you are interested, but you have never, I don't know, had the strength to pick up a big book like this, I'd recommend checking out a mini series by, done by CBC. Um, it was done not too long ago and I thought it was brilliant for getting me hooked on this book in the beginning, but also any other TV show adaptation. They're great to help you get interested in big classics if you want to know the characters before you get invested in a, reading a big book. So for my spoiler thoughts, I have a few big things I want to say. I first of all want to talk about the characters. I really love Becky Sharp. And I know that that's kind of a strange thing to say because some people might hate her. And I think that she is an anti-hero. But at the same time, I think that she is a, a very conniving woman. She is very helpful for her own sake. Um, but she is very devious <laughs> and I think that that shows itself to the best in so many situations. Like when she is in, was it India? When she's crying and Joseph Sedley finds her and she is just like, oh, I can't do anything. Poor me. And then as soon as he leaves, her friends come back and they're all laughing at him. I think that's just like, she's just such a clever woman. I just love how she's written and how she's devised. And I think that that just speaks to her character building. I really love just reading about Becky Sharp. She made me interested every single time. I also really loved how, um, I don't know. I really loved how, I didn't love Amelia as a character. Honestly, she's just such a doormat to me. I just don't like her, but I loved how to see the world through her eyes. I did enjoy seeing the world through her eyes because I thought that that gave me a different perspective than it did through Becky. I think that's what this book needed. Like, I think the beauty of this book is having the balance between Becky's sharp, sharp mind, sharp tongue, sharp wit, which her last name is very appropriate, and Amelia Sedley's very soft and kind ability to see the world. We needed both balances to keep this book in perspective. Just like we have Roland and George who are balanced of themselves being one a faithful husband, one a very unfaithful husband, and two having, you know, these characters always like a teeter-totter of watching the world go by. We also have the Napoleonic Wars going by and we see the world through the lens of these people who are balancing it out for us. So we can see one side which is very very clinical and very, uh, very crude and very distasteful for us as people being, how can we just see the money and how can we just see the greed? But then we see it through Amelia's eyes and we can kind of get a blended version. But then you also have these different people in the surrounding world, like Joseph Sedley, who are just kind of there and they're kind of comedic, but at the same time you feel for them because they are people. You know there are people like them out there in the world and they were before and there will be again and you just know that there are people who they struggle with awkwardness when they're with people. You know that there's those times. So I feel like those are really important moments to see through those dual lenses but at the same time I think there's one person who we don't have a dual lens for or the balance of and I can't pick one a pick a balance for him and that's Dobbin. I don't think we have someone who's a balance for him because for Dobbin we always have him as like I think our our compass I think he's supposed to be our moral compass for the book um <laughs> as much as that sounds kind of I don't know if does that sound ridiculous I don't think it does but I feel like Dobbin is the one character who we're supposed to know he is good he is right he is good he doesn't falter in anything and I think that's a little ridiculous to expect of a human being because as I was reading it, I was like, he is an enabler. He is giving in to everyone's expectations of himself. He is not perfectly good. He is just, he's weak. He is simple when it comes to everyone else's expectations. He does not care. He will give the girl he loves to his best friend who he knows is a womanizer. He will spend so much money on this girl that does not care for him. He will do anything 
just to make them happy. He will do, he will go and tell his best friend's dad that he is eloped. He will do anything to make anyone happy. He is not the good moral compass in my opinion. But maybe that's what William Thackeray thought. He thought that people needed to be that kind of person in that kind of world. And I don't know, but that's how, just how I felt. I honestly haven't looked up any summaries or any um, like spark notes or anything like that to have something else to <laughs> go against my opinions, but that's just what I felt going in. So I, or coming out, I should say, not going in, coming out of the story, I felt like that throughout the whole time reading. And I felt like Dobbin was just very much an enabler. And at a certain point, it flipped where he was being enabled by Amelia. But at the same time, he still enabled Amelia. So he was just still enabling. He was definitely someone who always gives and gives and gives and never gets back. And I just felt not heartbroken for him because at the same time, he's kind of bringing it on himself. But I kind of wanted to have him get a reality check saying, buddy, stop, stop giving money. Stop helping your friend, George. George does not deserve it. If you really want to help Amelia, help Amelia, but not George. If you really want to help certain people, stop doing the other things. Like I wanted to give him a reality check and you can't do that with a book character. Uh, there were other characters that I thoroughly enjoyed, like the boys. I thought they were interesting. Having two generations, or not two generations, but a second generation of the fathers who are both had passed away. Well, technically Roland hadn't passed away, but he had gone away. Um, he was no longer in the picture, I should say. So his son, which would be the next heir, after his father and then of course George Osborne the next one who was as spoiled as rot and as rotten as his dad and uh, as a child care provider I'm sure everyone on my channel is sick and tired of me saying this um it irks me to see children being spoiled rotten and then their parents saying oh I I love them so much they're so sweet as a child is being a bully because I'm like you are being a bad parent um but yeah, that's what Amelia did, um, or that's what her, his grandparents did or whatever, all those different things. I just didn't like those things. But at the same time, those are part of this book that you see these characters making their own mistakes. You see them developing this problem of, I'm just going to do the exact same thing over again. And you see the grandfather, Mr. Osborne, creating this world again for a child who unfortunately is named George, just like his son and having the exact same world of makeup, which created the monster who was George Osborne, who was a gambler, who was a womanizer, who didn't care about his wife, who didn't care about anything that would come. And unfortunately that meant that he left her in a very unfortunate place when he died. And then he's being, his son is being raised the exact same way. So, it's just a messy world. And that's, I think what this book really shows. It's a messy world. I think another interesting fact about this is that it has a yo-yo effect where certain characters are up and then down and up and then down. Like Amelia has complete poverty. And then later she is up again, or well, she starts up and then goes down, then goes up. Whereas Becky is completely poor. And then she later becomes wealthy off of the gambling debts of other men. And then she goes back down in the future. And then she gets back up again by being uh, Joseph's companion. And that's just the thing. Becky is just, she's really brilliant. And I admire that about her. But if you knew a Becky, you would not want to be her friend. Let's be real. We would not want to be Becky's friend. But I admire her. <laughs> um, let's just say that. I admire her. And I also really love the fact that this cover shows them as like puppets on his strings. I think that's really great for showing that we just all dance the dance. And I think in some ways we kind of live in a vanity fair where we all participate in those social normities, the social nice things. And yet it does not seem like we can break out. And I think that that's kind of what this book was talking about for a lot of the things where it talked about, you know, trying to do the right things and be the right person. And especially Becky Sharp, whose mother and father were not her fault. She did not choose to have those two parents, but they had her and therefore she had to deal with the consequences of their occupations, their lifestyle choices, 
and she could not have a, re a decent um, way to live. She could not have a decent way to choose a lifestyle. She could not have a decent way to pick a husband or anything because of her parents' choices in life, which I think is an interesting way of looking at it. But I've also got to say, love, love, love the scene where she's proposed to by her father-in-law. Hilarious. Hilarious. I love that scene where she's like, can you call me daughter instead? And I just know, I mean, it's not in the text, but I just know if she had a chance to go back in time, she would have refused Roland and she would have accepted his father because she would have gotten the money faster. I just know it. <laughs> Either way. Um, yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed this book again, gave it four stars, and I'm very excited that I was able to reread it and enjoy it again and really see the beauty for all it was again, but this time also have more of a keen sense for big old classics. And it's been, a, it was a crazy time reading it actually, because I think it took me two months to read the first time I read it, maybe even three months, and this time I read it in five days. And I just, I binged it because I really wanted to finish it in off in February, but at the same time, five days compared to two to three months. And I really loved reading it so fast because of that. And I think it's just shown how much I have improved as a big classics reader. That's something I really want to get better at. And I have, I think, I think that shows it. So either way, I really loved reading this. So if you have read Vanity Fair, please let me know down below in the comments what you thought of it, your thought of the characters, if you have a favorite or if you have a least favorite. My least favorite is Amelia um, or maybe even Dobbin because of just how much of an enabler he is. But my favorite is Becky Sharp, without a doubt. Um, uh, or maybe even Joseph, sadly, because I think he is just, yeah, he's just funny. But I would love to hear your, your thoughts on Vanity Fair or if you have never read it and you'd like to read it. I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, I also would just love to hear if you have another big classic that you'd recommend to me based on this one. Although I will say that this is not my type of book I would normally read, but I'd love to hear your suggestions if there's one you think I would enjoy. So please leave me a comment down below about all things Vanity Fair. And if you are new here and you'd like to subscribe, please do. And also if you would like to give this video a big thumbs up, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.